One evening in the spring of 1985, um, I stepped onto a balcony high up um, uh, above, above the Nile, and I looked onto a, a view more or less like this. Um, and what struck me more than, more than the beauty of the view, the light, the, you know, the, the glory of it, was the, the pulsing energy. There's a sound when you step out and into the night in Cairo, um, which which I didn't record there, but I, we could have gone on with, um, which is a sense of packed humanity going about all sorts of activities. Anything you'd think of is happening down there at this particular moment. Um, and I could hardly sleep with excitement. This, is the, this was my first night. I'd just come in from the airport. Um, and the next, the next morning, um, when I woke up, I, this, is, this is what I wrote down, because this is the view that I got. White sails unfurled, feluccas moved across the dark Nile. Traffic on the Corniche roads was still light. It was, it was quite early. And I could pick out individual sounds of people calling to one another, of a car's horn, and then a woman singing. On the horizon to my right, beyond the extensive jumble of roofs and towers on Cairo's west bank, across one half of the Nile Valley, the three main pyramids shimmered, a mirage made perfect by the distance, a hazy continuation of a dreamlike view. To the left, I looked across the heartland of Islamic Cairo. In there was the Mosque of Amr, the general from Mecca and friend of the Prophet Muhammad himself, who founded the city of Fustat, the camp, in 640 AD, and the University Mosque of Al-Azhar, which was built by the Fatimid general Goha in 970 and was the beginning of the city of al kahira the victorious Cairo. Now, I've been coming back to that river and to that view ever since. Um, in, in 1988, about three years after my first visit, I fell in love in Cairo, and a year later I got married, more or less on that piece of water just there. Um, and then I lived on a rooftop um, a little bit further down, um, somewhere, somewhere about there. And, um, you know, and, and on, on, our, on the evenings, at the end of the day, we'd sit together on the terrace, look over the river, and one or others would say, you'll never believe what, we saw to, what I saw today. <laughs> one day it would be a policeman waving traffic the wrong way down a one-way street. <laughs> Another it would be a sage, a wise old woman reading palms in a cafe. Another it would be the baker cycling through traffic with trays of flat bread on his head and no brakes on his bike. And so on and so on. Every day another wonder. Cairo, a city of surprises and wonders. It's also a city defined by geography, um, as you would have seen from the, from the map. Um, hemmed in by the desert, at the end, end of, the, of the Nile Valley, just where it opens up to the desert, I'm not sure which one, no. just where it opens up to the desert, on the route, route to the Red Sea, to Africa, to the Near East. It's a bridge, a trading post, a surprising cosmopolitan city. In the 1930s, there was a woman called Mrs. Devonshire who used to take small groups of lucky people traveling around Cairo. She'd have sort of day trips there. And she wrote, to a lover of history and art in general, Cairo is the most interesting city in the world. Surprise then and fascination as well. Florence Nightingale, who visited some 70 years earlier and who's the subject of my new book, um, published tomorrow and on sale here today, <laughs> put it differently. No one ever talks about the beauty of Cairo. No one ever gives you the least idea of this surpassing city. I thought it was a place to buy stores at and pass through on one's way to India, instead of it being the rose of cities, the garden of the desert, the pearl of Moorish architecture, the fairest, really the fairest place of earth below. And she had, you know, she had at this point, she was very familiar with Rome, with Paris, with. European cities, so it wasn't as though this was the first, she, first place that she'd seen when she stepped out of home. Well, people do talk about Cairo, but they don't always talk in such flattering terms now. Um, for many people, Cairo appears as it does to the guy I buy vegetables from uh, down in my market here in London. He took his wife to Cairo on a day trip. Uh, they were on, on holiday in Cyprus. Um, must have been a busy sort of day because <laughs> They, they, they flew from Cyprus very early in the morning. They saw the pyramids, went to the museum, saw all the Tutankhamun treasures, and then went to the souk. 
And uh, that's when the problem started. Uh, they stood in a square outside the mosque of Hussein and looked down the crowded alley, something like this, leading into the Khan al Khalili, the tourist bazaar, and decided to go no further. I thought, he told me, that if I took the missus in there, only one of us was coming out. <laughs> so what can we extract from these, these little glimpses? That Cairo is a city of beauty and surprise, of mystery, danger, exoticism, and perhaps also, above all, of crowds. Now, regarding the crowds, here are some facts. And, and I, there aren't too many facts I'm going to dish you tonight, but you're getting them all right at the beginning. In 1882, the population of Cairo was 400,000. It grew 50% in the next 15 years. It was around a million by the 1930s. In 1956, the year of the Suez Crisis, when the Brits were finally forced out, Cairo's population stood at 3.5 million. And some strange statistician calculated that there would be 4.2 million people by the end of the year 2000. I'm not quite sure where they were. Anyway, but that figure was reached by 1960. The population of Cairo now uh, nobody knows for sure, but it's around 18 million. London has 8 million. The M25 runs around London for 110 miles. That's about 190 kilometers. The ring road around Cairo is 110 kilometers. So you have a much, much smaller, smaller uh, uh, surface and many, many more people living it. Cairo is intense. It's packed. And life here is intense as well. A city of, uh, of such immense size, the largest in Africa, the largest in the Arab world, one of the largest in the world, is going to be many things to many people and many different things to different people. It's always been that way. People have seen in Cairo what they want to see. Take Major Jarvis, a British officer stationed in the city in the 1930s. He wrote a classic colonialist, tongue-in-cheek description of Cairo. He said, it has a population of 1 million, of which 955,000 are government officials, <laughs> and the odd 45,000 are servants, taxi drivers, shopkeepers, and sweepers. The city consists of shops and hotels, the Turf Club, the Gazira Club, and about 10,000 government offices. To the north is Abyssinia, where, where the soldiers live. North again is Heliopolis, where enormously wealthy retired Egyptians had palaces and the RAF has small flats. And south is Mahdi, where some highbrows addicted to gardening dwell. They also write poetry and, and, and read books. There are some pyramids and a sphinx to the west, and duck shoots to the northwest and southwest. East, there is nothing except the citadel, where Saladin used to keep a part of his army. That nothing in the east happens to be the heart of the city and the center of my fascination. This need to have a selective, a selective vision, which Major Jarvis takes to the extreme, this need to break down the mass, has become more pronounced as the city has grown. Um, it's, it's difficult to get hold of 18 million people to try and understand something about them. And that was something that was brought out by the great Kyrene novelist, Naguib Mahfouz, who, um, who, to the great pride of the Egyptian nation, won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1988. They made special mention of his Cairo trilogy, um, which is all set in the heartland of the Islamic city. Major Jarvis is nothing. Um, but soon after he won the prize, Mahfouz uh, went public and said, actually, he couldn't write anymore because he didn't have a subject. And he didn't have a subject because he didn't understand these people anymore. They'd moved away from him. Their, their aspirations, their desires, their behavior. He no longer understood what they wanted, who they were. And this mismatch between the man and, and, his, and his, the world around him was sadly brought out a few years later when, um, just, just like Salman Rushdie, there was a fatwa out against uh, Mahfouz. And he came out of his house one day and went into his car and thinking that uh, someone came up to, up to the window of his car and he thought it was somebody wanting his autograph, but unfortunately it was somebody who stuck a knife in his neck. Um, he survived happily, but uh, he never really got over that that shock of misunderstanding what had happened in his city.